It's Sunday, March 21st, 2021. I'm Jeff. Who's your bear? That's right. I am your bear. I'm Damon. I don't brew the tea. I just serve it. And that makes me Gary. Everyone else is thinking it, and I just say it. And welcome to Comes Out Live, the Bear Podcast, of Determined Length, episode number uh, 595. And we have the the ever lovely uh, Edward Angelini Cook with us. Hi. Yay. And before we get into this week's episode, I would just like to take a moment to recognize, Ed, that you have an accomplishment since the last time we talked to you. I do. Yes. So please let our audience know what happened as far as an achievement in the past week for you. Oh, I would love to. So this past Wednesday, I sat for my clinical license or my clinical social work license and I passed. Yay. Yay. So, so with this considered that you're officially a, a licensed social worker? This does a licensed clinical social worker. Ooh. Oh, mm-hmm. to be specific, which is a good thing. To be specific. Like I just want to snap. It was really yes. hard, and I also have. To, I want to. I want to say that. Uh, so the exam is really hard. So it's uh, about a hundred. It's not about. It is one hundred and seventy questions, <laughs> and uh, you know that's a lot. To, it's four hours, and it was. It was a lot. Uh, so what I did halfway through, I found myself getting really down on myself and I like took a second, I took a deep breath and then I envisioned a team of drag queens <laughs> walking in the room and um, uh, cheering me on. And I like flew through the rest of the exam. Mm-hmm. So thank you, Trixie Mattel, if you're listening. <laughs> when in doubt. Yeah. Well, when in doubt, uh, uh, make sure your sound is on when you're uh, putting your putting the stream on on your uh, uh, second screen. <laughs> My apologies. Yeah. Any so case, the stream is working. No, it, the the stream is fine. It's just I forgot to press another button. I'm getting thrown off by all the shenanigans that's been going on this morning. Anyways, moving on. Um. Uh, so we're here for another landscape of relationship show. Yes. Welcome to part five of an ongoing oh, series. Wait, wait, five. That's that's better. Uh, <laughs> ten. <laughs> five. We're five ninety-five. And this is part five. So there's like yeah. like we've got at least three fives in there. Yes. Lots of numbers. Which means that it's funny. Because funny things come in threes and fives. Okay. Oh, okay. I heard that before. It's it's a thing. How many comes in three? Improv. 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 Okay. Anyway, <laughs> continue. <laughs> <laughs> so, Ed, uh, we have not had you on for um, the landscape of relationships series uh, since uh, May, actually, of last year. But we had discussed um, back when we very first started this. The idea was that we were gonna um do a topic or two and now it's uh continued on and it's expanding so we're excited to to talk again with you um about something that can be highly beneficial to our audience and this time we're talking about trust which damon does not have much of at the moment given (laughs) the experiences this morning (laughs) ain't no lie ain't no lie there no lies detected go ahead so really are yeah um and for those that are aware uh from listening or observing with uh ed's interest before um a significant portion of today well i don't know if it's significant i think a significant portion of today's um, topic is going to be related to uh the one and only Brene brown um and uh talking Mm -hmm. about the elements of trust so i think it's pretty awesome that we're going to have this discussion because um, people might think that this series is like specifically about the intimate relationships in your life, but it can be about any relationship. Yeah. Um, 
there's a video that you'll make reference to later, I'm sure, um, that we have uh, available. And I was thinking, interestingly, one of the things that uh, she talks about in the video triggered a memory for me about coworkers Mm -hmm. checking in on me about things in my personal life. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I was like, oh, very interesting. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. That being said, um, so Ed, wh- what do you want to tell us about trust? Cool. Um, so, so I think trust is really interesting. Um, when uh, when I first started my, uh, you know, like psychotherapy kind of pri- like private practice journey, um, you know, it's an issue that comes up a lot. And uh, a way that I used to frame it with people is, um, like, have we talked about emotional banking? Mm, I don't think so. Like, do you, do you all know, like, the term, like, emotional banking? Like, the idea that, like, all of our emotions cannot be reserved for a specific person, right? Like, that we have to um, kind of divvy up our, our emotions, our sharing, our caring, our intimacy with a group of people, right? Mm-hmm. Um so I applied that to, to trust that like, you know, with trust, um, you know, it's kind of like a bank account that uh, we make deposits to this account um, in order to build up a big balance. And that is how we can, uh, you know, that that's how we develop trust. And with, um, you know, something that happened, like, you know, a, uh, you know, something that happens could deplete your entire balance. Um, and and that happens. So, you know, the um, the the journey towards rebuilding trust are these little small uh, deposits, right? And but when we talk about trust, like I was having a hard time communicating to my clients what trust actually is, uh, you know, because it's a really kind of big kind of amorphous uh, term. Uh, so I came across this video um, by the by none other than Brene Brown, who I think all social workers just worship. Um, and it is on the anatomy of trust. Um, and she she breaks down uh, this concept of trust as uh, the seven seven elements, right? One, two, three, yeah, seven elements uh, that make up trust. And she got those from, from, from her research, right? So this isn't just some random thing that she's coming up with. The research that she has conducted, uh, the, the qualitative research is, uh, is informing um, this, this method. Uh, so, I mean, I really like it. And the, uh, the way that she starts talking about it is that trust is like a marble jar which is very much like what I was, what I tell my clients is like kind of like a, like a bank. Right. So like um, being that like, you know, in a jar that's full of marbles, each one of those marbles represents some form of little bit of trust that I'm putting into my marble jar to know that you are my person that I can trust. Right. So like, so what I wanted to ask, uh, you know, you is when, when, when I were to ask you, right, before you watch this video, um, what is trust to you? Um, well, now that I've already seen it, like, I have to think, um, how I would answer before that. Um, (laughs) I mean, I, to me, there's different levels of trust. So, like, um, asking my neighbor to keep an eye out on things while I'm out on vacation is a certain level of trust. Um, My best friend messaging me and asking if I have a moment because they're, like, having a really anxious time and they want, um, you know, some – either they need me to be an anchor, to give spoons, to, you know, have – hold space for them, something – is it, I think a different kind of like trust, at least that's the way I I still, and I still kind of feel that way. Um, and that there's uh, different factors that go into to those kind of things. 
I, I would have yeah, to say, absolutely. I have to say that the that again, it, this is another thing. Having seen the video, um, it it kind of makes it hard to to describe. But um, when she was giving her analogy, it's like this is another form of an analogy that I would put with my former trust. Like she's using the analogy of a marble jar. Uh, I would just be like, like most things in life is, is there some sort of uh, continuum where there's the neutral trust where it's like, I don't distrust you, but I don't necessarily trust you. <laughs> You're just kind of neutral. And then based off of other people's actions, uh, I they just like start moving one way or the other on this like continuum, this this meter almost. Um, and the more you get to the trustful or, or trustworthy, I should say, um, the more that I will trust you. I, I could trust you to do these sort of things. Um, in anything that I need to be more, uh, or, or will make sure not to say anything. It, it, the more that you show me that you can somehow, uh, uh be reliably, like if I tell you something in confidence, I can trust that you're not going to share that with anybody. You know, you know that I'm venting or, or what have you. Um, uh, well, I may have attempted to trust somebody with something and their actions prove that they're not so trustworthy. So they start moving down the other direction. And it's just this kind of like uh, 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 sliding scale. That's probably even a better way of saying it. Of of where somebody would be be in to me as being trustworthy. Yeah, I would say like um, without using the words <laughs> in the elements, I, I think trust comes down to can I count on you in in whatever facet that is. Like, can I count on you to be on time? Can I count on you to come through? And what I need, um, will you fulfill whatever I, you know, have as expectations? Um, I think that's a big one. And I just realized that's not really talked about. It's not using that word. Let's put it that way. Um, in these elements, if you meet my expectations, like in terms of uh, committing and following through, I think that's that's important to people. Whether or not it gets to deeper things is another issue. Yeah. Well, I think that, like, for me, like, the way that I have um, been growing in my understanding of trust is uh, secure versus insecure. Um, like, is this a relationship that I feel like is secure, right? Like, uh, like can I rely um, on on you to be there when I need you to be there, right? Um and even if even if you're not there when I need you to be there, that you're kind of um, you're open to be you're open to my feedback that like, hey, you didn't like Gary, what you were kind of talking about. You you're open to my feedback that, hey, you didn't really miss the mark that day. Like that I can I can expect um, that more often than not that you're going to be there when 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 I need you to be there and when you say that you're going to be there. Mm -hmm. versus an insecure relationship, which is a relationship where I can't, um, like I, I have, I have no bearing that, um, that you're going to have all of these things that I, I kind of expect, I need, um, I desire in a, uh, in a, in an interpersonal relationship. Mm-hmm. And I think one of the things that like we as at least in American society, I'll put it that way, we have this concept that trust is built and destroyed 
like it's a it's a creative endeavor um and it has like both positives and negatives to it which is i think accurate um and and the concept of what Brene brings forward about its little things that add up to a bigger uh, value, so to speak, um, I found really interesting because when she talks in the beginning, she says about how her before the research, her presumption was that trust is created by um, like significant actions or events. And I, I think that's fair. Like, I, I think people view it that way um, when if they haven't if this alternative or this, uh, I guess, other definition or concept isn't put forward because uh, prior to seeing the video, it's really I don't know. It's difficult to kind of talk about it without like having now I've watched the video. So now like that's all that fills my head at the moment um, in talking about trust but it makes a lot of sense in terms of like relationships that you have whether they're like intimate ones with the people that you know um are the closest in your life that you spend um you know these times with or if it's just co-workers you know neighbors people on the street so to speak mm -hmm. well to to that point i think that um we, you know, so so she uses this example, like by these like kind of grand, big, big moments, right? But I think where that doesn't match up for me, and in my personal experience, is I would um, see those kind of relationships of people where they would be there for their those big things, but they weren't there for those little things, right? And I would be like. Um, and I would gauge my relationship based on those big, big, big things, but like then in the little things, like we're going to talk about, they, they weren't there and it really messed me up. Right. Like, mm -hmm. um, that, um, you know, can I trust you? <laughs> like, can I not trust you? Is this, a, is, is, a, is this a secure relationship? Is this not a secure relationship? Um, and that's why I really fall back on, um, kind of this this acronym that we're going to talk about because um you know we at times like we have to like evaluate our relationships in the small in the marble jars right like on the day-to-day -day basis or whatever um are you there um because i you know i think you bring up an excellent point and this isn't part of the the elements i mean it's there but it's not um, I think trust is about safety mm. or, or feeling safe. Like what are the, hang on. Uh, it's in here somewhere. It's not one of the, the acronyms. It, I think it's about vulnerability. Um, yes. Do you feel safe being vulnerable with whatever? And you bring up an excellent point that I've seen happen sometimes with, with people I hold close to me or in a in a certain circle they may not be in the closest circle they might be like a you know a ring or two out um as far as like you know interactions and and the things that we do how well we know each other but one thing that always surprises me is individuals that come to me and they're like upset about the actions of another person they consider a friend and then i kind of quiz them um not to really like poke at them but i'm trying to determine like what what uh foundational items did you use to to create this friendship like how how did you establish that this is a friendship is this just somebody that you hang out with like you know that's kind of more of an acquaintance than a friend per se and friends my definition i should say to be fair my my definition is friends would not do what you're coming to me about meaning what has happened between you and this other person is not something i would allow or stand for accept and certainly do not feel that a friend would do that and you are coming to me in a moment of crisis or confusion or whichever you know uh, negative emotional state this is because you're upset that they did this and i try very much to not be judgmental in that moment but what i'm recognizing is the expectation has not been met you don't feel safe with this person like your vulnerability with them is now questioned because you think you know they Perhaps they've revealed 
the authenticity or the truth of themselves and it's not in alignment with what you expect. And mm, that can be yes. that could be really difficult in the moment because what well, we have a really significant uh tendency like this this high frequency to do is we internalize our own measurements of value by the actions of others so if let's say damon and i are having a conversation and then something happens and damon does something that impacts me in a negative way I might internalize it and be like, well, that's on me. Like, well, Damon has some responsibility. I turn around and say things like, well, I chose Damon as a friend. I should know better. Which is really not fair. Like, yes, I can have some ownership to like my trust that I build with another person or what I give to that because I may in times feel like I can be safe with this person. I can be vulnerable with this person, but when that doesn't happen, like it's not, it's not a 50 50 like mm -hmm. in, in this analogy, I'm trying to establish poorly uh, <laughs> that, you know, Damon has responsibility for Damon's actions. Like it's one thing I have to sometimes say to people, I feel when I talk to them and they're, you know, going through something and, you know, what they're what they're dealing with is because of someone else. And I have to say, remember, their actions do not reflect on you. And if people choose to do that and say, well, because this person did this, I judge you this way. Hello, there's the key word. They're judging you like it's not about you. It's really about them and how they're seeing this other item. It's I, I think it's a it is a double edged sword and it's not difficult to maneuver through. And I don't know if, if that. Anyways, that whole path I just took made any sense, but. <laughs> I was here for it. <laughs> <laughs> well, you got real quiet and I was like, okay, I lost everybody. Great. All right. So Damon, what is, um, what is like, when you think about trust, what is like, you know, before you watch this video, what, what do you, what do you look at trust as? Before I watch the video? Oh God. Um. I will admit that was a really good video, but um, trust is to me. Um, she kind of mentioned it, but like I agree with like the vulnerability thing is like I'm opening myself up to you, to an, to you, and I am essentially trusting you with that information to not hurt me. If that mm. makes sense, yeah, like, or not use that use that information against me. Yeah, you know, like like I but like the video really helped, and I was like, oh shit, like like girl was on point with stuff, but um, it was it was a lot of so as someone who has had their trust broken with someone for one reason or another, um. I it made a lot of sense. And one of the things that I know made the most sense was when she mentioned the vulnerability part. Because mm -hmm. that was just like the like, you know, icing on the cake. I'm trusting you with something, either my life in general or just my status or information or something that I am giving to you to not necessarily use against me um and whatever that may be and that trust can be broken when that information is used in a negative way yeah so like uh so she she makes mention of these two quotes that help guide her resource uh her research uh by charles feldman and the the first one is um that that damon's kind of talking about is Trust is choosing to make something important to you vulnerable to the actions of somebody else. And then um, her and then Charles's uh, definition of mistrust is mistrust is what I shared with you that is important to me is not safe with you. Um, yeah. And that really hit me upside the head. Mm -hmm. um, that was the I one. That, yeah. <laughs> Well, and I think that's key because, you know, what, what Feldman is pointing out is 
like it, it's a two way street. Like, you know, it, it goes in both directions. It's like communication. You can't have communication if only one person's doing all the talking and one person's doing all the listening. That's not really, I mean, it is communication, but it's not effective. Um, and, and, you know, I need to footnote that, like, if the, if the context of the moment is for someone to talk and for someone to listen, like to hold space, that's totally different. I'm just saying like in generalities, you know, when you, when you give of yourself to another, there's trust in that, that they're going to respect what you're giving and, um, to not do that. Like, sorry, I was just having a moment. Um, I'm having a memory uh, about how I met somebody I never knew before and was really kind of swept off my feet. But then pretty soon discerned like things were not as I thought they were in being presented. And it was a real struggle because there was a part of me that was like, wow, I really like. I've not felt this, you know, if ever, like being the focus of attention and, um, you know, really drawn into the charisma of this person. That said, um, a lot of things started slowly, like not making sense. Um, and my gut was basically giving me this, you know, my spidey sense, whatever you want to say, mm -hmm. like something was telling me like things are not quite what they seem or oh, there's God. right. There's, there's a lot more to the story. And then as time went on, and we didn't really communicate with each other. And I was like, okay, I can't. And I was like, okay, I don't know if you lied to me. I don't know what the whole story is, but I, I'm, I'm not into this. And so I chose to just like kind of disappear and ghost out. Mm -hmm. um, this person notably uh, has like attempted at least once to get in touch with me. And I'm like, girl, I can't like, and I haven't <laughs> even told them. And I realize it's very disrespectful, but it's kind of like, I feel like you disrespected me. Like, I don't think you were being authentic and honest with me. And maybe what you were saying is truth and it's and it's like, you know, like a fucking like 30 layer crepe cake girl. I don't know if I have time to like delve into all of that and understand how complex this thing is. It, it's not for me. Yeah. Thanks. But no, thanks. Um, and it is a little tricky because uh, I have discovered a, a, a sizable number of people are affiliated with this individual. And I'm like, OK. I'm I'm I brace myself a little bit because I feel vulnerable about my experience and I don't want to uh, shade or paint other people who are affiliated with this individual. Like I don't want to project onto them or judge them because they have a connection with this person because I don't know if this is really just a me experience or if others are being duped if they have the same feel you know what i mean like it's it's like ooh, that's that's kind of touchy in a way mm -hmm. um so it, and i'm also it, not a person who goes about and airs all my business like also and, you know, so um <laughs> yeah girl i mean we know gary we know well uh, i i i mean that that's the thing is like even though some of these people i have you know i have confidant in like you know in, in certain respects i don't know if i would I don't, I don't, I just know right now, I don't feel comfortable in talking to them being like, Hey, you and I know this mutual person and I like, I'm very wary of them, <laughs> but I don't like them. Mama. No, but, um, <laughs> I don't like them. Mama. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, I, uh, yeah, I've been thinking about the, the whole idea of trust and I've been going through my head. And one of the things that just popped in my head while you were, were discussing things was, you know, there is some trust as we're kind of getting into relationship parts of it. Like there's some trust given in like, um, I'm going to be blunt, like in anonymous, you know, or not anonymous, but like, like in hookups, mm -hmm. in sexual like encounters, you know, depending on the level of conversation you have, um, there is a level of trust built, maybe small, but there is some trust there um the biggest one being depending on where they are in their you know express you know homosexual like like lifestyle or whatever if they're not out as an example like 
whoever you're put if they are not out they are trusting you to not spread their secret as it were um are if it's a random encounter in a bar um dark room of a bar like maybe um there might be a certain level small but small it may be but a certain level of trust in regards to like you're not going to go out and tell my business you know with everyone there so david i think you're really really like on the nerve or the pulse of the of like msm like mm-hmm. aspects about trust so like dindin in the live chat was like um saying this is a hard one i know the gays are shaking meaning the topic um and i you know had said you know uh shaking because they don't uh, trust others and they were like yes <laughs> and I think this is key, like, like, like foundationally, we as an LGBTQIA plus community struggle with trust because we develop, we grow, we evolve as, as just persons. And the, the thing is, is that we most likely, or at least up until I will say the change of the millennia felt predominantly like we couldn't trust others because mm-hmm. of the experiences society was giving us, at least as, as far as America goes. Mm-hmm. Um, we'd been through so many highs and lows in variable ways. And now that we're 21 years past the change of the century or the, like, good God. Anyways, time is <laughs> troubling. Um, you know, we, we probably feel more comfortable with trusting others, but we still like it trickles into so many different things. So I agree with you. Like the hookup culture is, is reliant on trust, but it also like pushes back against trust because anonymous sex isn't, is, is about trust, but it's very minimal. Like, do I trust you in this moment to have this experience with me and probably not to air my laundry, so to speak. But -hmm. at the same time, like, like it's very controlling. It's like, I don't have trust of establishing a relationship with a person. I only want to have this limited intimacy with you. Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. let's get the seven minutes out of the way. Thank you very much. So I could get my like hormonal endorphin rush and move on with my life. Mm -hmm. And I can see where that would be a struggle for some folks. Like even I uh, will come clean about this. That's a horrible reference. Sorry. (laughs) I will, I will, uh, speak truth to the fact that like a couple of years ago there was a person who i think is originally from this area kind of traveled back and forth and when they were in town they would you know want to hook up but what i realized is like the hookup wasn't just a hookup like they were um wanting to spend some time together like they were not like the wham bam thank you and i'm gone like they were kind of hanging out and they like would kind of talk and open up a little bit about their life and i was struggling with it because i was like okay listen the reason you were here was like for some DNA instruction. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> like, just because you're sitting on my couch does not mean this is a therapy session. Like, <laughs> one, not licensed. Two, did not sign up for this. No offense. <laughs> um, and if for some reason they come across this video, like, my apologies, I never communicated this to you. I kind of ghosted on you, but like, I, that's not what I was looking for. And we also didn't set that expectation or communicate that no offense. Mm-hmm. So you didn't have my, you didn't have my consent to opening up and discussing your personal life. And I don't know if this individual has less connections in their life or mm-hmm. the fact that they felt comfortable or safe with me. Um, maybe it was hormones. Like afterwards they were in this great afterglow. So they just like, you know, kind of wanted to talk about things. I don't know. Um, but I use this as an example of like how intriguing it is, like how, fine line like i guess a tightrope intimacy can be with another person when it comes to trust especially in the context of the example i gave it was meant to not be like this bonding moment so to speak you know that was not the intention of it it was like um you're coming over and i'm gonna get you off and we're both gonna be happy and you're gonna leave that's how simple Uh that is um (laughs) but you know that's not always uh how people view things and it kind of goes back to the whole communication item. You know, what are we, what are we saying or not saying to each other? What are we, you know, setting um, as the parameters or uh, what are the elements? The first one, boundaries. So that's a good segue. So let's kind of get into this this acronym um, that Brene Brown uh, created as a result of 
the research that she conducted with her team. Um, and she found that like, as she asked people questions about the element of trust, some, some common themes came up and she, she put those into an acronym called BRAVING, B-R-A-V-I-N-G. And that acronym stands for Boundaries, Reliability, Accountability, Vault, Integrity, Non-Judgment, and Generosity. So, um, you know, we've talked about the concept of boundaries in, I think, like the third or the second uh, landscape of relationships uh, podcast, but like, uh, or, you know, episode, but it was... Uh, like the concept of boundaries, I think like when we talk about like expectations and agreements, right, those are all kind of wrapped up in, in the boundaries that we set with others. But um, but she found that like, um, you know, what boundaries are, are that like the idea that you're going to respect my boundaries, I'm going to respect yours. And when we're when we're not clear or when you're not clear or when I'm not clear about what's okay or not okay, that we are giving each other the uh, the freedom to ask. Um, and that there is this, understa this understanding um, and this willingness to say no. Right, because you, I mean, Damon, I don't know if you and I were both uh, kind of on the same page, like immediately I was thinking about um, BDSM kink leather culture mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. and and consent really comes down to this like yeah. if you don't discuss these things in advance bad things can happen or yeah. not so great outcomes I should say yeah 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 agreed that was kind of where I was going at you know boundaries are very important especially in like dynamics where you are well well let's put it let's just call it what it is like a, a dom sub BDSM type like kink relationship there is essentially a sub are the sub is essentially relinquishing their trust to the dom and they are trusting that the dom will take care of them within a set of boundaries <laughs> that mm -hmm. uh, have been predetermined depending on the scene or the, the long-term relationship like there is generally that big part of that is like setting the rules and and following a protocol and then if something is a problem or something is an issue like you talk about it um because that's how the relationship no matter either if it's a short thing or a long-term thing um is set you can't go out you should not go outside of those boundaries unless you have been given permission to do so mm -hmm. you and, know? Uh, boundaries and rules are in part two from january of 2021 2020 so we're just awesome and, and i think one of the key things about like relationships and you know talking about boundaries and you know um consent expectations all of these items is definitively that part about um like and you were saying like willing to say no like either party but uh, to me it's it's consistent and open communication within like the structure of that. So if you're establishing a relationship with a person, whether it's a friendship, it's an intimate one, friends with benefits, a partner, a spouse, um, you know, you, you need to keep in mind that there are limitations, um, you know, on what you're willing to share and what you're not willing to share. And I think over time, confidence, and strengthen the relationship is built from expanding the boundaries, like, and, and saying, okay, like I've let you know this part of me. Now, you know, this, and then over time, now, you know, this, like, I think of my best friend, we've been, we've been friends for 25 years. We don't have an exact date. We, we approximate. Um, but <laughs> one of the things is like, we talk greatly about our families and like, and all the things that we've been through. And, and what's interesting is of late, we've been a little nostalgic and talking about our past and different elements of where we lived and the jobs that we had and the things that we experienced and what went on. And so, yeah, we do have some like repeating stories, but what I realized in that is like, these were all the little things that like developed over time. But in the very beginning, we didn't know each other. Like we not at all, like we were complete strangers. And I definitely did not trust this person. Because I didn't know them, 
Like, I was like, you're mm-hmm. a complete stranger to me. Like, you are the um, Twitter pated interest <laughs> of my best friend at the time. So, to me, you're a complete stranger, but they are really like almost head over heels for you. So, I'm going <laughs> to, you know, kind of have my own personal boundary and keep you at a certain distance because I don't know you. And then started developing um, over time what that was. And it was the same in reciprocal. They didn't know me like and they, you know, were not aware. And so uh, I don't want to say that we were two stray cats like circling each other in an alley, like in in defensive posture, although that is a fun analogy. Um, (laughs) We, you know, just kind of didn't know each other. But over time we developed and we grew and, you know, we ended up establishing some really interesting bonds through shared experiences um but we we kept changing that over time i keep thinking of like concentric circles that's why i'm doing this thing with my hands um (laughs) you know and and so we kept broadening it and um the more we expanded our boundaries towards each other the more they ended up like a venn diagram like overlapping and then um you know being a more shared space but we're not you know as best friends we're not like circles on top of each other i think of probably intimate relationships more that way like especially people that you're gonna um that you've made the decision to share your life with you know most likely partners spouses um those type of things anyways you're you're you look you look very contemplative ed (laughs) no i'm um um i was uh like when i so my thing when it comes to boundaries is you brought up a really good point to know your limits and that like you don't have to share everything right off the bat right and i think that's to kind of go back to the point that we were making before about um the big gestures um Mm -hmm. there is this thing that has come up for um for me um you know as a like you know i'm realizing that uh, you know i am an individual who struggles with insecure um attachment issues right and kind of growing up i thought that um trust was the like you you know kind of you know everything about me therefore you can't leave me Mm. and um then so like for me it was like that that big grand gesture like i'm letting you in on everything right and that is in trust, you know, and that's kind of what I'm, what I'm, what I'm finding. Um, and that like, it takes time. Uh, and that like, I think we talked about it. There's this um, relationship uh, therapist, uh, David Schnarch, and he talks about um, intimacy as like, intimacy is you knowing who you are and letting somebody else in on the secret. Um, but like we can't have like intimate relationships with literally strangers, mm-hmm. right? Like that that gets developed over time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so with so the next uh, concepts so of reliability, um, I think this is kind of like a uh, like an expanded upon version of boundaries. Um, it's like a result of boundaries. So that's saying that like. Uh, you're gonna like so you are going to do what you say you're going to do um and we can do this and we'll we'll get to this but like the idea of trust doesn't isn't just with um romantic relationships or Mm -hmm. uh you know it's we we establish these kind of um concepts with every single relationship that we have hold in our life work relationships friends things like that so um you know, she talks about with work that, you know, reliability means like staying aware of your competencies and limitations so that you don't over promise something and that you're able to deliver on what you say that you're going to be able to deliver on. And reliability is also a research concept uh, in that, like, you know, what we're measuring, um, we are, we are, uh, we are aware that everything that we are um, um, everything that we are talking about is what we're talking about. So like, it's, it's a reliable measure. Um, so I think what's, what's interesting, uh, about reliability is I think the, the delivery, like mm-hmm. 
can can you or can you not um, be counted on for that you know that 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 meeting that expectation i guess um sorry i'm like <laughs> i got all these thoughts um i mean i think the first part of the definition is the key thing you do what you say you'll do um you know and and it comes in many different forms you know like i think about like in terms of like you know the the podcast for instance you know we're here at the time that we say we're going to be here so you know folks no. can what do we have something to say i think he no knows that's that's not, not that's it. all <laughs> he, he said we'll be here at the time we said we're going to be here and i'm like well we okay we... go ahead Keep Listen, going. Mr. Passive Aggressive. So <laughs> what I'm saying is, to the broader audience, we are reliable to be here on time. I was not g getting into our business as hosts about whether or not we're here for pre-show on time, which is, I think, what you're getting at. So that being said... Crack <laughs> <laughs> that head. <laughs> First of all... <laughs> Girl. But I will... I. I... So I'm just, I mean, literally just the example that I just had, um, like we just talked about it this morning, as I just scarfed out my breakfast, like an hour later. Um, yeah, liability. Like, like I'm just going to, I'm going to use it. I don't care. Like, it's a big thing for me. Um, <laughs> but this was the perfect example. Like you, I was given an estimate and it went past that. And, and more so um, there was all the other issues that happened with it. And I understand why it happened. Like, I, as I've, you know, dealt with this before, you know, I understood it, but it makes me less, inter you know, I'm probably not going to use them, you know, again for a little while. I'm probably going to move on for a little bit and try something else and see if something else happens. For all I know, I might do something off. Well, anyway, but um, uh, the reliability of work is a big thing. Um, it's one of the, it's not one of the core values. It used to be one of the core values of my of the my of the company that I work for, um, but it is something, especially at work, that you want. You want someone to be reliable, and in like personal relationships, friendships, you know, you know, intimate, what have you, um, reliability is kind of really important because you, if someone is flaky, if someone's not going to like own up to their expectations are they put too much on their plate you know and that happens and we all know we all know we've been there you know too many spoons what have you we don't have enough time we don't we try to do everything that we can but we can't um it happens but when it happens more often then i think that person needs to take some personal evaluation and realize what they can and can't do mm -hmm. um, um a perfect example that i have is um I, we have a friend, um, well, he's a more acquaintance of mine, but he's a friend of my friend. And he, he is notoriously never on time. Like, like to the point where it's a joke. You know, you say it's supposed to happen at six, but you tell them five because they're not going to, so that they'll get there on at the actual time they're supposed to be to get there. You know that. You know that person. You've all had that person in their lives. Um, mm -hmm. And it's just that person is not reliable. And we, you know that. But why do you keep like you? You why do you keep opening your trust to him? Like I, my friend in particular. Like we were the big thing was we were planning a big trip. And they were going to be the one that was, the friend of the friend was going to be the one who was driving. So we had this total expectation. It was going to be a long-term, you know, drive, like six to eight hours. And the whole idea was to get there, like, in a day. Like, we were going to leave at, like, early in the morning and then drive the whole way, you know, make stops along the way for lunch, dinner, whatever. But the whole point was to get there where we need to get there in time. And... We're sitting there at his place, like two hours late, three hours late, four hours later, 
and he's still not there. Mm. And it's just like, so it throws everything off and we end up leaving later, much later than we planned it on. And because of everything that happened, we ended up having to get a hotel, like not all the way there. We weren't even all the way there because of the fact that this person chose to take their time and do whatever they were doing. I don't even know. And it was kind of like, why, why would you even do that? So, right. And, and what you're describing, Damon, I think is really important. Like, you know, there was um, an expectation. I don't know if I want to say general or presumed, like, you know, mm-hmm. that there would be a timeliness mm-hmm. to this, you know, uh, this experience, this moment, and it kind of didn't work out. Mm-hmm. So, and I yeah. think that's like, I mean, I own this for me, you know, in my experience, um, reliability is a is a key thing that makes me very wary of other people um because i feel like probably more often than not i've needed help and not since i really kind of probably became like an uh a post education adult do i ask because i just think i've constantly like was expecting other people to to deliver and it's not happening. Do you know what I mean? Like it's not coming through. They're not um, showing up for me, which is understandable. I don't, I don't think it's necessarily fair, mm-hmm. um, you know, because looking back on it, I'm like, well, was I, was I telling them, you know, and, and yeah. setting that expectation and, and yeah. going through those things? Or did I just take it for granted, which is what a lot of my young adult life was. I just presumed nonstop that, my experiences were your experiences. The way I was raised is the way you were raised, like in terms of like faith mm-hmm. and values and all these things. So I didn't understand. It's like, why can't you fill in the blank? Yeah. It's like, well, yeah. cause you ignorant fuck. Like they're not you. <laughs> <laughs> I well, mean, but it's it true though. True. It's true. Um, I want to, like, I'm, I'm with you, Gary. Like one of my biggest, one of my personal flaws is expect like putting expectations on someone and and not telling them um like i don't be out like i don't you know i put expectations on people i expect you to be on time i expect you to to like to to express what you need what have you and this is just kind of generalizing relationship part of things and if you i because that's what i would want to do but and that's what i feel like i do but if I don't tell you that that's what I'm expecting, then you don't know, and you could be totally in a different, you know, realm. You know, with regards to how you do things, you may be the laissez-faire, like whatever. I'll get it done when I get it done. You could be the procrastinator that pre- provides and presents awesome work, but you need the the stress of the moment to get it done and then get it done well you get it done like beautifully like you create that piece of art you write that um essay for work or essay for school or whatever but you do it like in the crunch time because you know if you try to like do it beforehand or take the long time and try to get all the books and everything written it it it's not going to be as good you needed that pressure in order to get it done but you didn't you only you know that but i don't know that but i'm expecting you to get it done and i'm surprised when you don't get it done in the way that i would get it done for for reference in regards to communication see part part three of this series (laughs) (laughs) so i but this i mean this this is true though like it's all inter like woven with each other i mean the the different things that we've discussed so far in the series and i was just thinking david about what you were discussing and i was like yeah like but i took it in a total different direction it's like if i don't set the expectation with you like what i want out of this intimate experience then i should not be surprised that i'm disappointed by what happens Mm -hmm, you know mm -hmm. like if if I have a trigger, if I have a certain thing that like gets me off and you yeah. don't do it, do it. Yeah. Who who am I to hold accountable for that? Like if Ed and I are having this intimate moment and I'm expecting him to like buzz the shit out of my prostate, but I don't <laughs> tell him to do that, 
Like, <laughs> exactly. <who's... laughs> I need to know, Gary. <laughs> Um, I will bring the supercharged one. Like, I will bring that, like, <laughs> like, like, you will know, you will feel this fucker. Like, <laughs> right. so, so instead of a, so, so instead of a Hitachi wand, it's a cattle prod. Got it. So, <laughs> no, but I mean, the, that's kind of the the thing. I think we don't. I, I just think as an American society, we have a really, really, really significantly big struggle with that. Like. Mm-hmm the the communication piece that creates the reliability like if i don't explain things if i don't put it out there and we don't have that discussion then what do you expect it's kind of this is gonna this is gonna be an interesting uh, off the cuff analogy it's like making a dish of food if you have a recipe the recipe is telling you the steps to follow it's setting the expectation here are the things you need this is the order in which you do this and here is the end result if we don't do that with our own lives and, and attempt some uh, assembly of that, then what do you think you're going to get in the end? If you want a, you know, a French toast casserole and in the end you end up with porridge, well, bitch, like, like, did you, did you, did you provide a recipe? Did you lay out anything as like context or what the expectation was? You know, do you know is what mise en place is? <laughs> Right. Like, do you know that I have like erotic zones of my body and those are the parts of foreplay and that's what I'm expecting. Anyways. Yeah. Anyway, I'm see part three of our series in regards to communication. <laughs> so we're talking about accountability, which happens to be the next part of this. Um, mm-hmm. And I think this is a really big one. Um, not that any of these are, are less than the other ones, but um, but when we're talking about accountability, it's just the idea that like, when you mess up, right, when you make a mistake, that you're apologizing for that mistake and, and, and you make amends for that mistake. Mm-hmm. So, Ed, what do you think make amends means? Good question, Gary. Well, because <laughs> it, if, if you, it, it'll be on our website uh, when this episode uh, posts in a couple days, this the seven elements of trust from from braving the acronym. This has the least definition. <laughs> it's short, sweet, to the point. However, I think it needs elaboration. <laughs> yeah. So um, maybe we can put this on the list uh, for future Ooh. landscape of relationship. But like, I think that uh, apologies and um, forgiveness would be a really good um, would be a really good topic so um when we're talking about apologies right well first when we're talking about mistakes mistakes are going to happen right um like that is inevitable that's going to happen but what we do in response to that mistake is really critical to um to the relationship so you know a lot of times we hear oh i'm sorry right um that's not it kid <laughs> You know, like, uh, yeah. you know, just saying I'm sorry isn't um, it, it's it's not going to work in, in a lot of situations. Right. So an apology is um, and, you know, like I said, so we can go into a whole nother thing with this, but it's basically acknowledging the, the damage that that occurred to that person and um, understanding the role that you played in it and acknowledging what you want to do in order to correct that wrong. Right. Um, And being reliable in that. So doing what you say you're going to do. So like Mm -hmm. if, you know, say, um, um, I don't know, I can't come up with an example off the top of my head, but like, you know, say, uh, Gary, I hurt you. I, uh, you know, I didn't hit your prostate. Right. And uh, and you really wanted me to hit your prostate when we're having that intimate moment. And you tell me like, hey, you, you messed up. You know, I really this moment was was not great because you didn't do that. So that's why I would say, hey, you know, I'm really sorry. Um, You know, I recognize that that's really important to you. Um, You know, I want to make this up to you because you are important to me. So um, I will make an amends to make sure that I'm paying attention or or giving extra care to your prostate moving forward. Mm -hmm. And doing what I say that I'm going to, you know, and then mm-hmm. that way that can help make amends to the situation. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah. I, I think – go ahead, Damon. I, I can't remember the quote, but there's something about um, – like an apology without action is is oh I can't remember the end of it oh it's uh, dust in the mouth yeah yeah like it's nothing it's it, it's it's just sand it's, in the mouth that's it yeah yeah so that's kind of what I see here with this um, accountability aspect of things is like yeah I can say I'm sorry till I'm red in the face you know and I can apologize every time I do something wrong to you but if I don't follow up that that apology with like actions or actually changing the behavior then it wasn't really an apology to begin with was it well that's why so like i went online to see if i could find that quote but instead of finding all these other really impactful quotes um so for instance an apology without change is just manipulation yeah yeah that's the other one i remember yeah and i'm like Mm -hmm. wow Mm -hmm. like or a version of that is an apology without changed behavior is just um, manipulation. I mean, they're all, they're all kind of coming back around to saying the same things. Like you can apologize over and over, but if your actions don't change, the words become meaningless. Mm-hmm. Um, actions speak louder than words. Sorry means nothing without any change. Yeah. Like, so I think that's what making amends is, is meaning. Um, you can ask for forgiveness which is theoretically what an apology is. Um, but you have to be able to deliver on that to, to, to obtain it. And I think that's the, the thing that um, we as Americans are pretty quippy. Like we love a, a turn of phrase. We like saying a certain thing, but these, these quotes that I was just going over are about like, you need to be able to back it up. Like you can't just say to somebody, I'm sorry that I fill in the blank, you know, like, for example, if what happened to Damon and Jim this morning is to be corrected, like not only is an apology for should be forthcoming, but then action should be, you know, coming up and, and reinforcing, making Mm -hmm. amends, you know, correcting the, the grievance, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. Mm. Not just a credit. I mean, yeah. <laughs> credit. credit helps. That kind of sounded like, well, the credit would be all right. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, so I'm going to, I will, again, I hate going back to this thing again, but I will own it was also my fault for trusting that what would happen would happen. Like what was supposed to happen would happen. Because I'm just going to, I should have followed the, direction that I was given beforehand that definitely was available and I should have just like made a bowl of cereal or made a cup of coffee and just let it go and then like did something later but when you know it was it was on me I will admit to like getting the little notification and thinking oh well everything will be fine now because everything is supposedly working well yeah And that's also another key piece of, you know, accountability, Um, you know, owning your mistakes is, you know, about being humble and accepting, like, if you, if you misunderstood, um, you know, made a mistake, misread, misinterpreted, whatever uh, the situation may be, um, misheard, you know, those kind of things um, that you take ownership of that but there comes a certain point like my first thought was like damon about how i felt like you you wanted to take more responsibility than was necessary Mm -hmm. um and and that's another key thing i think that we as a society have a tendency to go for is Mm -hmm. well it's my fault and Mm -hmm. i think one of the things that I find, I don't want to express this across the community, but I think one of the reasons why I look to certain people and put them a little bit on a pedestal, like, which is, you know, measured, um, is because they have a strong personality. And more often than not, the lesson they're kind of giving us is, hold up, baby, like, 
you do not have to apologize for things that were not in your control. Like you are not responsible for things that are beyond you. So like, while you may have ownership of being in a bad relationship, you did not do things to get physically beaten. You Mm -hmm. did not do things to create the financial like strife that you're facing, whatever, whatever the circumstances. And I think that we look towards those people because they kind of talk clearly like they 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 make sense of the moment and kind of make the fog go away of whatever the situation is and simply say like no hold up like like while you may have ownership of making some choices what happens to you is not necessarily your doing Mm -hmm. like while you could put yourself in a in a in an environment in a circumstance in a moment in a situation you can have responsibility over that, but other people's actions impacting your life is their responsibility. Like they have ownership over that. And I think that we, we as a, as a society have a tendency to take on ownership that isn't really ours. Mm. Like, like you hurt me and I'm responsible for that. No bitch. They hurt you. Mm. Like you're not responsible for their actions of hurting you. You would be responsible for trusting them and then being hurt, but that's a whole different thing. Like, and I think that is difficult to parse out, like to, to say where, like to kind of, uh, I don't know, like using this analogy, but like, you know, to carve out, you know, to say, okay, this is where your thing lies, but that is not yours. Mm-hmm. Um, like I think of this recently, like if you go to, so if you go shopping for something and let's say, you know, you buy some fresh fruit and you bring it home and you have like a bag of oranges, let's say, and one of them is moldy. Well, like you're not responsible for the moldy orange. Do you know what I mean? Like Mm -hmm. it exists now. Could you take responsibility? Cause you didn't take apart the bag and inspect every single fricking orange in the bag. Absolutely. But like, there comes a line where you're like, "Eh, okay, like let's, let's be realistic or practical about this moment of, you know, accountability and who really has the mistake you know, and, and should that, where does that responsibility lie? I guess that's where I'm mm-hmm. going with all that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. And you really intrigue me because you're a really good listener, but I don't know what's going on. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I mean, I'm, um, I mean, I'm thinking about like a, 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 a recent example where um, I've had to take stock of a lot of the relationships in my life. And as far as accountability goes, you know, I had a, a situation where a friend really made a really big mistake um, and uh, he apologized, um, kind of, and um, and kind of blamed me <laughs> for oh. the- uh, for the for for his mistake, um, and because I was because I was in a state where I wanted just things to go back to the way that they were, I was willing to accept his half apology mm-hmm. and just say it's okay, it's okay, you know, I don't care. And then, you know, afterwards, um, you know, I said, hey, well, you know, listen, I I need these things to change, right? Like, you know, I will accept your apology, right. uh, but I I need these things, right? Like, we, you know, there has to be some things that change, and nothing changed, um, and I found myself feeling really unstable, very insecure, very, you know, mistrustful of this relationship, and like. Because I was like, but like, there's this laundry list of these, of these things that, that I would consider, you know, marbles in the trust jar. I was like, I can't like, you know, how can I, like, how can I end this relationship with somebody? Um, But it went back to the idea that like the accountability was not there. And the fact that like, there was not an apology and Mm -hmm. To your point, like I was assuming responsibility for something that was not my responsibility. Mm. Um, and eventually I had to say, listen, I love you, but I can't do this anymore. Um, and that came with some consequences, right? Um, like, I feel like that's had some consequences on surrounding relationships. Um, mm-hmm. But I need to take care of me. Um, yeah. And uh, it's it's been difficult here. I would, 
also say this. Um, oh, it just went out of my head. What you were, it was responding to what you were just saying, Ed. Um, so I think that accountability. Um, oh, holding people accountable for their actions is a piece of this. Like you, you can own your own mistakes and apologize and make amends. But um, I guess I want to put this little caveat in there. Not everyone is aware of what they've done. So if someone has done something and you feel it deserves an apology, you may have to tell them because I don't know how else to explain it. They may be oblivious or ignorant or unaware. Like they may be, um, and I don't really don't like saying it this way. They may be so self-absorbed like that. They're just like, they're in their own insulated bubble that they have no idea how that impacts others. Yeah. And until someone points it out or draws attention to it or has a discussion or labels it, names it, whatever, um, you know, describes it, they may not realize that that's a thing and how it's impacting others. And therefore they have an ability or they have a moment to apologize and then make amends. So I think of it this way. If you don't tell someone that they consistently talk over you and you never feel like you can get a word in edgewise, and this is not about my co-host, then <laughs> <laughs> like, but if you don't have that discussion with them, you know, that, that every time you're around them, they suck all the air out of the room or whatever, you know, like, like how that impacts you, they may not know. And I think that's one of the things that we have a huge tendency, in, at least in America, is like we, uh, I think a lot of people, a significant amount of people avoid confrontation. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. to avoid confrontation, to avoid like, you know, a scuffle of, of a fight, whether it be verbal or physical or whatever, we, we just kind of scoot around. Like we just, we just try to be like water and we just try to like find a way to get past whatever the thing is when we are not really addressing it. And the yeah. problem with that is like, there are times when that makes sense. Like, especially if it's an infrequent or, you know, once a, once in a whatever, mm. but when it keeps recurring, like you're not doing any uh, service to yourself or to others, especially the other person when like they may not realize how they're behaving. So I think about like in the context of like coworkers and team members in the moment, I'm aware that there's a, a person uh, as an employee that has exhibited these behaviors. And it appears there's a group of people that are all in consensus about the way this individual is behaving. And what I just realized is, but no one's talking to this person. Like no one's addressing it and saying to them, no offense. This is how like this this is how you have come across as an individual. No one's discussing that. And I think it's because it's a difficult conversation. It takes a significant amount of delt uh, of adulting, quote unquote, like personal ownership and being comfortable enough in your own skin to engage in such a, a conversation with another mm -hmm. person. Because understandably, you're like, what would the outcomes of this be? Will there be fallout? Like, will it amplify their their behaviors? Will they be willing to hear the message? You know, and I and I think that's one of the things that we have a tendency also to do is to say, oh, well, we we don't give them the benefit of the doubt that they can change because mm -hmm. you're like, well, if they're not changing and they've been this way for X amount of time, why would they change? Well, bitch, did you talk to him? Like, did you give him a chance? Like. Mm -hmm. Because you hate their grilled cheese because they burn it every fucking time, do you tell them that it's burnt? Hello? <laughs> like, you I know. Mean, like, <laughs> no one wants a burnt grilled cheese. I mean, that's such a thing, but whatever. Uh, <laughs> well, I mean, like, 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 I'm thinking about it right now. It's like, I like my scrambled eggs a certain way. Not many people make them the way I like them. It's not, but that's on, but I have some ownership of that. Like, if I don't tell them, you know, mm -hmm. I don't care for my eggs that way, you know. Mm -hmm. Then yeah. that's where, again, where like my accountability comes into, I, I don't tell them that. Now, if oh. I do talk to them about it and again, they don't change or make an attempt to modify, then that's where I think the accountability becomes important and trust. Cause then you're mm -hmm. like, you know, I've asked you, you know, I can't even count the number of times I've asked you to replace the toilet paper roll. And bitch, you ever do. So that diminishes trust between the two of mm -hmm. us because I'm like, if you can't get this one simple task done, what I think is a simple task, 
then they were saying I'll be able to. Uh, yeah. Yep. 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 You <laughs> hit, yeah. No. Well, I, I was going to say like you hit the nail on the head in a lot of ways um, when you mentioned um, the non-confrontational confrontation aspects of of society. It's a big part of it. Like we we prefer we prefer. I mean, there. Okay. There are people out there that are like confront me, bitch. Like we we know that we know there are people out there like that. They're like, I will take you to task. I have no problem doing it. You know, point blank period. Like I'm done. But most people are not that way. They would rather avoid conflict. They would rather um, not do anything to 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 upset someone or whatever. Like and that and we think like we tend to think of that as like. You know, being respectful and being nice in, 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 in some ways, but sometimes it becomes that negative of like, um, well, you don't, you become, start becoming a doormat. You know, you start becoming less, um, it's easy to like the manipulation part of it. You know, the apology is, apology without, without action is manipulation. Like if you don't confront someone that when they've apologized to you, to be accountable for what they've done, then they're just going to keep doing it until you either point it out or leave. Like that's that's kind of the way it is, you know. But some people won't confront someone because they're afraid of the conflict and and what could potentially happen. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. There we go. You know what? Uh, I think this is a two-parter. Actually, we've been chatting that this is going to be a (laughs) two-parter. We're going to be accountable in the fact that uh, uh, we are reliably going to split this into more reasonable chunks. (laughs) Uh, Because because we, we respect your boundaries. We have integrity, and and this is not to be judgmental. Uh, so we're going to be generous to provide you another episode of Landscape of Relationships. We are shutting um, the ball okay. on this episode for now. We are braving into a new frontier of <laughs> another Stop show. It. Stop it, Jeff! You're giving away my like entire like synopsis of the episode. Like- <laughs> So here's here's a, a perfect example of like how fluid um, braving and trust can be. We established that we were going to have this re- this like episode. We were going to you know put it together, and as we were going through it, I was like, I don't know if we're going to be able to cover all of these pieces of this in the time frame we normally do an episode. Hence, we started chatting like you know internally about like you know. Maybe we could split it into some pieces, yeah. and that's what we've decided to do. Because we're putting it in a vault for now, and we haven't even gotten to that yet. Uh, <laughs> but and we were planning on having you and you know here for a, a number of episodes anyway. So we'll just continue the discussion about trust in the next one. Yeah, yeah. and we have an entire playlist in regards to all this. Uh, you can find uh, all of our episodes over on comesoutloud.com where you can leave a comment on the blog. You can shoot us an email at comesoutloud at gmail.com if you have any comments in regards to trust or even questions. Uh, we'll, we'll, we welcome your questions. Uh, if you want to, you can give us a jingle at uh, our phone number at 361 Talk. That's 361-265-8255. You can follow us Follow us on various social media outlets, including Facebook, Tumblr, Twitter, and YouTube, or even just chat with us directly over on Telegram at telegram at tinyurl.com slash telegram dash col. Uh, you can find out when we're planning to record these things and what topics we're showing uh, over at our calendar at tinyurl.com slash calendar dash col. You can get various accoutrements such as version one, a version three, even version two uh, comes out loud logo shirts. No, none of us have version two on right now, but you know, it's there. As well as many other things over on Zazzle, zazzle.com slash comes out loud. Come a patron, get the uh, uh, VODs and, and audio versions of these shows over on uh, patreon.com slash comes out loud. Uh, if you want to send us some cash to help us improve this, and hey, guess what's coming up in a month? 
uh, uh, hosting <laughs> renewal, which is a big chunk of money, but it's for every two years. So that's why it's a big chunk of money. Um, that's, you can send us some cash at people.me slash comes out loud. Uh, you can uh, rate us and subscribe to us through Apple Podcasts, Google Play, uh, Amazon, Audible, and Spotify. You can find me anywhere on the internet as box at box, puppy box, cub box, something or other. Or you can check out my Twitches on Wednesday, currently on Wednesdays and Thursdays at Windgem, uh, W-Y-N-D-G-E-M. Demon? If you wish to get in touch with me, you can find me on most very related sites as Theater Cup 79. And it also includes Facebook for some reason. Or you can find me as pup underscore umbra on Twitter. The Twitter is not safe for work. Some people might be into that. Um, if you want to get in touch with me, you can pretty much find me anywhere online as GareBear73. Hey, and if you if you do uh want to get in touch with me because of the podcast, let me know. Like because otherwise, you look like a complete stranger, and I don't know if you're a bot or what your story is. Um, so, you know. Uh-huh. And Mr. Ed, as our guest, if folks would like to get in touch with you um, and talk more about trust or other items, uh, what would they do to find you online? Sure. So uh, you can find me on Facebook at Edward AC. Um, you can find me on Twitter at either Eddie H. Cook or um, Jeep Daddy 3. Jeep Daddy 3 is uh, definitely not safe for work. Um, you can find me on Instagram at uh, Unicub, sex, Unicub underscore sex brain wizard. Um, and you can also find me on uh, my new favorite platform, uh, TikTok at Unicub79. And with that, uh, say good day, everybody. Bye, everybody. <laughs> Ciao for now. <laughs> <laughs>